Rusty Quill Presents. Ain't Slayed Nobody is a produced actual play podcast intended for adults, and may contain material that some people find disturbing. Please see the episode notes for content warnings, and listen with care. Ain't Slayed Nobody proudly presents Lamp Posts in Bloom. The scenario was written by Scott Dorward for Unknown Armies, but it's easy enough to follow along if you don't know that game. This two-part series presents our actual play with dialogue editing, but it is not fully produced with extensive music and sound effects. See the episode notes for content warnings. This is a nasty little scenario with children in peril. Enjoy. I've been away for a while Did you miss me? I see the hint of a smile it with everyone having gathered again back at the Ockley residence. There was that moment of recognition from Richard and Evelyn about the child and the picture and the name Simon. And as you said that name out loud, you'd heard the sound of laughter from within the house. Natasha looks panic-stricken and looks down at Evie. They're both tending to Jeremy right now. We recognize the name, and do we have the association of, like, the significance of that? I will leave stuff like that to you to extrapolate at this stage. Let me ask this, though. As the only person, I think, who where this is in question, do I recognize that name? Yeah. Yeah, it certainly sounds very familiar. Hmm. I'm going to wrap my arms around Jeremy's neck and just bury my face in his neck and say, I'm so sorry. It was the only only choice I had. You would have done the same thing. I had to. What are you talking about? Shh. I had to, Jeremy. She starts to cry softly into your neck and doesn't answer. Hey, 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 hey. And he's hugging her back at this point. He's like, hey, it's it's going to be fine. Let's just we'll figure this out. We always do. She pulls away from you and there's just terror in her eyes as they look at you. Hey, it's it's fine. Nat, it's me. It's fine. We'll get through this. We always figure things out. This time it's different, Jeremy. I thought I figured it out. What are you talking about, Nat? Simon. Who... Who is Simon? Like, who is that? Why do I know that name? He's a memory. Is there anything that came after the laughter? Because she's got one ear towards the, the screen door. No. It sounded like it came from upstairs, but that's... You just had the one laugh and no sounds after that. Natasha's not going up there. I think having heard that, like, right after the laughter, Richard... Especially after that guy came in, he bolts into the house. I think Evelyn goes with him, yeah. Now who is here? Who who are all of these people in this house? Natasha's going to take over whatever she saw Evelyn doing to your thigh, Jeremy, and put pressure on the wound or keep wrapping it or whatever. You can see that, yes, there are two puncture marks there, and there is the barbecue fork sitting there on the ground beside him. I thought you were going to say still sticking out of the leg. <laughs> oh, no. Like we hadn't really done a whole lot of triage on it yet. <laughs> Richard and Evelyn were heading into the house. And the way the house is laid out, there's an upstairs, there's a flight of stairs that goes up there. 
and oh, this isn't a particularly large house. There are a few rooms upstairs. There's the bedroom or converted bedroom that Richard uses as a home office. There's a lavatory up there. There's the master bedroom. And there's another bedroom that you've really just used for storage. Now that you're up there on the landing, you can see that last bedroom. There's something over the door handle. And looking at it, there's a pair of what looks like child-sized soccer boots tied by the laces hanging over the door handle. Richard. What the fuck is going on? I don't know. Why does our home keep getting invaded today? First Lenny, then that guy with the suit. (laughs) Now this laughter. I love that Lenny's (sighs) part of that group. (laughs) Lenny's sneaking down the hall with the bus photo. Trying to get out of the house. Okay. <laughs> uh, Evie goes over and picks up the, the soccer boots off of the, the handle. And just kind of, like, turns them over and over. Did you put those there? Was that... Did, like, Nat bring those or something? What, what are those, Evelyn? Are these... Close to Simons, aren't they? These were Simons. Our Simons. Our... Our Simons? I'm going to open the door and go into this room. This is the storeroom that you've used for boxes of stuff that you just didn't have space to put in the the rest of the house. You know, a few old curios and gifts and stuff like that, a couple of bits of furniture. Evie's like, starts knocking stuff over. She's looking for something and has no idea what. She's just like rummaging. You start pulling stuff over, you know, moving boxes. And yeah, there is something in here that doesn't belong. Up against one wall under a pile of boxes, there's a bed that you don't remember being in here, a small bed, a child-sized bed. I think she just kind of like steps back once she's uncovered it and uh, kind of like makes room, looks, looks over at Richard. Is this Simon's room? Is this... This is Simon's room. What the fuck is going on? What was that guy saying when he came here? What was he saying? Something about necromancy? What? No. Your friend. Nat's friend. That occult shit you always talk about, the restricted section. Does that have anything to do with necromancy? Well, let's just go fucking find out, okay? Uh, Evie's gonna bolt out of the room and look for Lenny. Richard's going to do a quick sweep of the top floor. Just He heard that laughter. He's going to look in the other rooms to make sure, like, what, what did we just hear that? Or was the laughter coming from one of the rooms? There's that certain moment in every scenario where you feel like other players are about to visit violence on Cuppy Cup. <laughs> it's, there's, like a, there's like a beat in each episode. You know that moment. <laughs> So Richard does a quick scan of upstairs, and no, there's no sign of anyone else up here. Evelyn had gone downstairs looking for Lenny, and Lenny was in the process of sneaking out. Just in the interest of drama, you do catch him just as he's heading out the front door. She's she's like gripping these um these shoes in her hand she runs up i'm assuming like if you're trying to get out your back is to me when i first come in so um grab you by the shoulder whip you around just like right up in your face and um like she's holding these shoes and and she'll say lenny what evie what the fuck is going on lenny what i remember a simon there are these, there's a bed upstairs. There are these shoes. Please, please, uh, please just fucking tell me what's going on. I, I don't know. I don't know any Simon. Uh, uh, he, he's going to try to like walk backward toward the door while talking to Evie. I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know you that well. Lenny, please, Lenny, please, please. Something is wrong. Something is happening. Please just tell me what you know. No, I don't know. I, I noticed, too. Something's going on with, I don't know, Jeremy, you and Richard. It's all a little weird, but uh, I got nothing to do with it. I, I just... I, 
Evie lets lets you go and just like collapses on the floor and just is like bawling. Richard catches the tail end of that as he's done the sweep upstairs and walks up to you. Says, "Are you a necromancer? Is that what that guy was talking about? Is that you? Who? What? No, everyone's gone mad. What? What are you talking about, Richard? Uh, I'm not a necromancer. I'm a librarian." Uh, I- By the way, I think it's fair to say that this conversation is loud enough that Natasha and Jeremy can hear it out on the patio while Natasha's finishing binding up Jeremy's leg. I I come inside and I'm just listening in the hallway and watching them. Jeremy just walks straight in and he's got a pronounced limp at this point, but... Mm. All right, everyone needs to stop what they're doing and tell me what the hell is going on right now. We're just here for a simple barbecue. We've got some great steaks outside. I just want to have a barbecue with my friends. Yeah, me too. I don't know what's going on. You, Lenny, shut up. Honey, you're not supposed to be here. What are you talking about, Nat? I was invited here by your family. That's not what I mean. That's not what I mean, sweetheart. I... Well, then tell me what you mean, Nat. Tell me something. I want you here so much. So much. You're all that I want. I'm right here. And there was a price. Evie, I'm so sorry. You had to pay the price, too. I didn't know what would happen. I think she looks up at you and there's like no accusation. It is just like a pure and sincere question. Now, what did you do? We did a ritual. She looks at Lenny. Lenny doesn't remember, but he was there. And, um... Well, Jeremy's here now. He was in that accident, and, and the front-on collision, and no one survived, but then... Then he was just back. And then Simon just... wasn't... Nat, what are you talking about? I've never been in an accident. Yeah, you have, honey. Don't tell me you haven't noticed. Sometimes you're just different. You're just cold all the time when we're sitting next to a fire. And sometimes, you know, there would just be a bug crawling on your hand when we're sitting outside and then they'll be everywhere. And they're not on me. Do you never notice these things? You know what? I don't, I don't have time for this. And Jeremy goes back outside and starts making himself a plate because he's going to have a barbecue at his friend's house. So he is angrily putting a hot dog steak on a plate and piling up this nasty macaroni salad that he can't stand. And he's just piling up huge amounts of it. And then he's going to sit down at the picnic table outside and he's going to start eating. And as you sit down and start eating, you look over and the soccer ball is sitting over there by the flowers. Edie, whose soccer ball is this? Whose soccer ball is this? Edie doesn't even hear that. Because there's like, now there is a a calculus going on inside her head. And she looks at Nat and she says, you said he was in an accident? Yeah, that's right. When? Six months ago. Uh, Evie jumps up, runs outside, (laughs) and uh, goes up to Jeremy. Jeremy. Um, I'm pregnant. Um, and... And none of this makes any sense, but now I'm I'm a little worried about what is going on and what that means. Listen, Evie, does, does Richard know? He found the pregnancy test this morning, yeah? Evie, does Richard know? No. No, he doesn't. Oh. Okay. Well, then... There's nothing to know. What if what Nat is saying is true? What, what, 
That I'm dead? That I'm dead and I'm just sitting here dead? What if that's true? I don't know what's going on. I... What do I do with that information? I don't know. What do I do with 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 Simon? What do I do with with all of this? What do I like? What do in the house now? It's just Richard, Matt, and Lenny. Yeah. Nat runs over to Richard and gives him a hug. He hugs you back, and like, kind of doesn't let go. What did you do? Did what I had to. Don't speak in riddles. Tell me what you did. And Lenny sees as she puts a fist in in Richard's jacket pocket. Yeah. And then the fist comes out with nothing inside it. Good girl. I need to know what you did. Can you undo it? I I made you think that <laughs> that you once knew someone named Simon. It's just a prank, right, Lenny? Yeah, it's a Nat. You know it's all bullshit. You're a, you're a journalist, uh, Richard. This isn't real. This is no. I know this is all bullshit. No, it's it's mentalism. We it's a trick. It's it's fine. We can shut up, Lenny. <sighs> Nat. We are family, and I know, I feel it, that Simon was real, and I need you to tell me, please, what did you do, and can you undo it? I need, I need him in my life. I wish I could undo it, Richard. I wish I could, but... It doesn't work like that. There's no instruction manual. There's no you know, technical notes. And so all we can do is just keep moving forward. And that's what I have to do. I have to keep going on the path I'm on, Richard. How can we move forward? Matt? Did you kill our son? No, I would never do that. I would love any son of yours. I would love him like he's my own. I wish you wouldn't lie about this. I'm not lying. I loved him so much. I did too. And you hear the sound of small footsteps running upstairs. I run upstairs and follow the footsteps. I do too. I call out Simon. Trying to get Nat's attention. Like, Nat, we gotta go! Oh, uh... I, again, I'm torn on the stairs. Looking between Richard and Lenny. Well, it's, it's your call. It sounded like Richard was heading up. Yeah. Calling out Simon... I stop and I let Richard go and I come back down the landing to Lenny. Did you get it? Yeah, I got the article. I got it. You you put you put the chips in. I saw you. That's everything we need. We can they'll forget. It this will undo at least what they know. Uh, it's the only thing we can do, I think. Okay. Richard looks into Simon's bedroom because that's what it is. And it's different than the last time you looked at it. None of the boxes are there, but the bed is there and it's made up. But there's other things in here as well. There's a few bits of furniture. There's a wardrobe and a chest of drawers. There's a laundry hamper that's got a few bits of children's clothing in it, including what looks like a soccer strip that you can see has got some blood on it. The window ledge has got a few toys lined up. There are a few posters up on the wall. There are a few Star Wars posters up there. And there's a couple of Liverpool FC posters, and that's the team that your dad supported back in England. It's in your mind that, yeah, your, your dad... That's right, he got Simon interested in soccer. He got him supporting Liverpool. You'd watch every game with him, wouldn't you? But the thing that catches your eye most of all is that the, the bed is made up 
now. And you can see that there is a depression on the bed, as if there's a weight on there, but you can't see what's causing it. And it's maybe the right kind of outline for a child lying on the bed, except it's not quite right. One of the legs is just wrong, in the wrong place, and the wrong shape. And there's something terribly wrong with the shape of the head that's pressing down on the pillow. Richard walks up to the bed and kneels down beside it. Simon? You're just looking at this empty space. He's going to reach out and touch. First, like, trying to touch as if there's a person there, like, not touching the sheets, but above it. And if if he doesn't reach anything solid, he'll continue and kind of touch the depression of the mattress. There's nothing solid there, but the sheets where you touch are warm. Simon. And your fingers feel a bit sticky. And there's blood on them. Simon, are you... Are you hurt? Papa's here. The rest of you can hear that from downstairs. Jeremy's going upstairs. I think Lenny and Nat went outside and are getting in their car. This is our only chance, yeah. If Evie heard the front door open, I think that she would go out after. Absolutely, and you can see them heading over towards Len's car. Uh, She'll call out after, Nat, Nat, where are you going? I ignore her and just keep walking. Lenny's trying to jump in the driver's seat and take off. I think that Evan will get in front of the car. I get out of the car. Evie, move. Nat, there was a man here who was talking about necromancy. And he was saying that he was going to kill someone, many people. I don't know. I knew someone was watching me. I knew. I knew this couldn't be so easy. What did? Where did he go? The Mercedes. He was driving a Mercedes. Nat, can you tell me what's going on? <sighs> Evie, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to fix it. You're never going to know the difference. It's going to be fine, Evie. We're going to have fun. Okay, we'll go on that trip. Remember how we talked about going to Cabo? We could do that trip to Cabo. Just you and me, okay? When all this is done. Nat, did you... Did you think it was going to be fun when you did it the first time? You don't even know what you're talking about, Evie. You don't know what I did. You don't know what's going on. You're right. No, Nat, I don't know what's going on. I'm asking you, please, please just tell me. Please, please. There isn't time for that right now, Evie. There isn't time. I have to make a decision and I've made it, okay? So get out of my way. If the man comes back, tell him to wait for me. Nat, I don't know what you're doing. And I think that maybe you took my son. If you're doing something else, please bring him back. Just take me. Please, just, please don't hurt anyone else. Just take me, okay? Oh, we can bring Simon back, okay? I think we can do that. I think we can do that. It's just everything has a cost. I'll, I'll pay it. I'll pay it, okay? I'll, I'll pay it. Whatever that price is, whatever the cost is, I'll pay it. No. No, that's too much. Please. I won't pay that price. You're so important to me, Evie. Nat, I've been sleeping with Jeremy. What? For about three months. What? How many months? Three. Three months. And I'm pregnant. Fuck all of this. Linny? You want to go to Cabo? (laughs) (laughs) Get in, Nat. (laughs) 
<laughs> he's he's hitting the side of the door. <laughs> and then they drive off into the sunset and scene. <laughs> you what? Jeremy would never do that. You would never do that. What? You're sleeping with my husband? I'm not going to try to justify it. I'm not going to try to explain it. What about you and Richard? We've just, we've been trying for so long and it's just, it's been straining our marriage and I love him. I do. I love him, but there's, what are we even talking about? What are we even talking about? What am I even doing? What? Natasha's going to walk back in the house. She's going to walk to the back patio and she's going to get the barbecue fork. Oh God. Okay. (laughs) When Nat started walking away, Lenny starts laying on the horn. <laughs> Lenny, new plan. She yells without looking back as she walks into the house. Fuck, fuck, fuck. He's trying to decide whether to stay or to just take off and go to Cabo by himself. <laughs> uh, he's going to sit in the car for now. Okay, so Natasha has gone back inside and grabbed the barbecue fork. Richard is upstairs kneeling by... Simon's bed. What was Jeremy doing? Jeremy was going upstairs to see what was going on up there. And there you can see, as I described, this child's bedroom with Richard kneeling by the bed, looking at the blood on his fingertips. Richard, what is going on? Simon, he's he's hurt. This is, this is his blood. I, I don't know. He, he was here. Simon? Simon, Papa's here. Richard, there's no one here. No, Simon's here. There's no one here. Simon is here, Jeremy. As you're saying this, there is a slow change to the quality of the air or the space above the bed where they, that depression is, is a bit like you saw in the photograph before, that it just seems to be getting a bit darker. Simon? Richard, what have you done? Simon, it's okay. <laughs> I think that probably prompts a rank three unnatural check for both of you. All right. Did I just roll a 99? Can I spend luck? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I failed that. Okay, so you both failed, did you? With doubles, both of them. Yeah, I got a <laughs> doubles. <laughs> Matched failure. Okay, so I think Jeremy is reacting particularly badly here, but you both get a failed notch and unnatural. And so you are both losing your shit in whatever way you decide is appropriate. I think Richard starts going for the, the clothes, the soccer clothes, and the mm. is uh, we got to get him ready for the game. Um, Simon's got a Simon's got a game. We got to we got to take him. Um, yeah, here's this here's this uniform. Here's his kit. Oh, where's his shoes? I know I had them earlier. They um, where'd they go? They were hanging over the door handle, weren't they? Yeah, are they still there? Yeah, they're back there. Oh, good. They're right here. Here's his shoes. Um, Simon, Simon, I got you. You got to start getting dressed, okay? You're going to have to clean this kid. There's blood all over it. He's hurt. Jeremy, go get me a, a washcloth from the bathroom. It's down the hall. So Jeremy has gotten the distinct impression that all of this does genuinely involve him Mm. and that whatever's happening in this room is not good for him. And he is actually going into a bit of a flight. He is getting out of here. He's getting out of this room and he's running back downstairs. Okay, so it sounds like as the sisters are coming back into the house, 
Natasha has gone back outside and picked up the uh, the barbecue fork. Jeremy is running down the stairs. He looks white as a sheet. Nat, we're getting out of here. We're going home. Uh, Nat comes back inside, walks straight up to him, tears pouring down her face, uh, and she lifts up the barbecue fork, aiming for the left side of his chest, and tries her hardest to slam. Give me a struggle roll for Natasha. I've got self-defense. Oh, yeah, that'll do. <laughs> Wait, does this count as self-defense? <laughs> I was going to say, this is self-offense. <laughs> Stop making me stab you. <laughs> what have you got that as a percentage? Because here you're rolling against the skill because this is combat. Uh, yeah, well, I got a 58%, but I needed 30 Jeremy sees this at the last moment. He sees his wife suddenly bring up this barbecue fork and try to stab him and manages to step back just in time. The barbecue fork still catches your clothing and rips it. There's a a little bit of blood, but it doesn't stab into you. Jeremy's going to yell out, Nat, what the hell? You're not Jeremy. You're something else. I want to see if I can sort of counter to sort of restrain her. Because I have control and restraint as a skill? By all means, yeah, if you want to do that and see whether you can disarm her or put her in a wrist lock. Okay, I rolled a 26. My skill is 45. All I'm doing is disarming her. I'm not trying to hurt her or anything. Okay, so yeah, you can just grab the barbecue fork out of her hand. Nat, what the hell is wrong with you? What is going on? She's just repeating... You're not supposed to be here. You're not supposed to be here. I think Evie runs in and everyone's like freaking out and like there's something instinctual that happens. She runs in, she wraps her arms around uh, around Nat and she kind of like puts, I guess, her forehead against Nat's forehead, just kind of like leaning there and just kind of like holding her really tight and just kind of like saying over and over, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Nat. We'll get through this. It's okay. It's okay. And I think that I'm going to, can I try to comfort her? You absolutely can. Becca, if you're happy with this as a player... Oh, yeah, I lean into Evie. I accept this. Okay, then there's no role involved. You comfort people for a living. You're good at this, so... I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Nat. I'm trying to fix it. I was so wrong. I was still trying to make bad decisions, but I'm done. I'm done. I I should never have messed with fate. While they're talking, the gravity of what is what she is saying and what that weird dude who came into the house was saying and whatever's going on upstairs is sinking into Jeremy. You see his shoulders kind of slump down and he just slowly walks outside to where Lenny is in the car still, right, Lenny? He's standing in the threshold, I think, of the door when you try to do that. Jeremy's going to say, Lenny... Take me to where this happened. No, Jeremy, I I need everybody to listen to me. Lenny, Lenny, take me where this happened. Listen, it's fake. It's gone too far. Everything's just snowballed. It's out of proportion now. You all need to listen to me. This whole thing is just a a fucked up thing I was trying to do and it got out of hand. It's a it's a persuasion technique. Uh, I was trying to learn something. Jeremy puts the barbecue fork to his throat. It says, Lenny. Take me to where this happened. Nothing happened. Listen, I was, I was trying, I was, I was sweet on that. And I was trying to do something that I thought could bring us closer together. The fork pushes into his neck a little bit, like enough to draw a little blood. So Scott, I'm trying to use this one thing he's good at, which is convincing people of the effects of spells. So I'm trying to convince them (laughs) that this is some minor spell that's gotten out of hand. Uh, It's not real. Jeremy, you're fine. You're not dead. I I was trying to convince Nat that you were dead and that there was this nephew who never existed. I I don't know. I was reading too much and I I thought I could do something, maybe go to Cabo with Nat, but it's all fake. There's there's nothing. Nothing here is real. 
Now, outside of whether or not I believe the spell is real or not, you are saying that you were trying to take my wife to Cabo. <laughs> and I have a fork to your throat. <laughs> so, this is a heartfelt moment that we're having. Uh, no, I'm being honest with you. I'm going to take him down to the ground. Uh, okay. Okay. Is Lenny trying to resist this or is is Richard just pinning him to the ground? I don't want to get stabbed through the throat, but I think I'm I'm still trying to play with my, you know, the soft skills. Okay. So he pins you down to the ground while you're still spouting bullshit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's 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 the power of persuasion, Jeremy. You have to hear me out. It, it's not what it looks like. Uh, it was a bad prank. Yeah, Lenny, tell tell me more about how you wanted to take my wife to Cabo. Tell me more. You know, I have trouble fitting in. She was so nice to me. I just wanted to impress her. And I knew that without magic, I I didn't have a chance. So uh, I made up this whole story and uh, I don't know. It's just, it's mentalism. Like I said, you got to believe me. Typical man. Nice to him. Thinks he can take you to Cabo. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Too real. (laughs) Come on, Jeremy, you know me. You know, I, I don't know real magic. Lenny, I don't know you from shit. Well, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. Jeremy's going to stand up and say, Lenny, you've got 10 seconds to get the fuck out of here. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'll run out the door. I think at that moment, Richard comes down the stairs holding the boots, like the soccer cleats and the kit. He just kind of slowly walks down the stairs, not really paying too much attention to what's going on. And he's kind of mumbling, got to get the blood out. Richard is covered in blood at this stage. Oh my god. Uh gotta, Richard? Gotta get the blood out. Gotta take him to, to the game. Is he here? Yeah, he's he's in bed. Simon's upstairs. But his his kit's got it's got blood on it, so we gotta wash it out so we can go play. I don't know what to do, Evie. I don't know what to do. I, I I don't know either. Richard, you, he's upstairs? Yeah. Let's go together. I take her hand. Squeezes it, like, real tight. I think, like, reverting back to those moments when you would, like, protect her from the scary things. And, yeah, you head upstairs to Simon's room. And even before you go into the room, just from the landing, you can smell the blood. Was Richard traveling up with them? I think he'll kind of travel back up in a almost a daze. And I think for Richard, this is where you had that vague memory of, yeah, the, first of all, Jeremy did die, didn't he? He died in a car accident while on duty. But then, then there was another accident. And it's all that talk about getting his football kit ready and so on. That's jogged something loose in your memory. And you do remember you were taking Simon off to a soccer match he was playing. And there was another accident. Then after that, everything changed. You remember how bad the accident was. The car was a write-off. You were badly injured, but Simon took the worst of it. When you go back into the room with Evelyn and Natasha and see what's lying on the bed, you remember just how bad that accident was. What's on the bed is barely recognisable as a human form. I can't look. The crash. And you can just hear it's struggling as it's trying to breathe this kind of wet, bubbling sound. Simon? Simon, I'm sorry, it was my... my fault? Simon? And Richard's gonna run up and... try to hug him. Yeah, the blood is soaking into you, and you can see why... The shape of the head on the bed on the pillow looked so wrong as you're doing that, but you can just hear bubbling up through his ruined mouth the 
just that one word of daddy. Yeah, Simon. It's me. I'm here. It's going to be okay, okay? It's going to be okay. Mama's here too. Evie's just been frozen in the door um, and then snaps out of it when uh, Richard references her um, and goes over. And I think that there's like a moment of she wants to help. She wants to be able to like to to bandage or fix or something. But just like looking at his body just knows like. Yeah, some wounds can't be bandaged. And so she's just frozen. She's just like standing over him. Faced with this, I do want a rank five self-check from Natasha, of seeing the real consequences of, of what happened. 69 under 70. You are holding it together. You've got one hard notch in self there, and you are holding it together. Do I remember the second accident now? You weren't there for that, but that bit doesn't necessarily make as much sense to you. Uh, we can't bring him back. What's done is done. He's gone now, too. Oh, come on. Nat, come on. We can't mess with this anymore. It, it doesn't work. Someone's cutting down the roses. They're cutting down the lilies. We can't. They won't let us. They won't let us take control. What roses? What lilies? What are you talking about? That's why you remember Simon. This man you saw, you said a suit? He must be the one. He cut them down. And that's why Simon came back, and you remember. And that's why Jeremy can't stay. I don't think he can stay. I don't know if I want him to. You both betrayed me. What are you talking about? Jeremy isn't himself. He's done things since I brought him back that he would never, ever do. He's made my sister do things she wouldn't do. Richard thinks about this morning and what he found in the trash and pieces together their, their past several months. Mm knows that that doesn't make any sense. Evie can't make eye contact. I see. <laughs> Evie. I'm so sorry, Richard. I'm so, so sorry. Where's Jeremy? He's made his way back out into the backyard. Just absolutely affectless at this point and he is sitting at the picnic table and he is just eating macaroni salad straight out of the bowl it's warm now it's gross but he's just sort of staring into the middle distance well richard's rage trigger is betrayal so i think Ooh. he's gonna stand up not looking at evelyn at all and start walking downstairs to find Jeremy. So you do find him out in the patio, comfort-eating. He's just going to walk up with a, with a very quick pace and just try to punch him in the face. If you're happy not resolving that mechanically, just treating that as colour, then Jeremy is snapped out of his fugue state by suddenly getting thumped in the face and falling backwards off the chair onto the patio. Evelyn! 
You slept with Evelyn? Jeremy doesn't even try to get up from the ground. He's just still laying on the ground and he looks at, he doesn't make eye contact with Richard. He's actually still kind of just staring up at the sky, but into the middle distance. And he just sort of nods his head. You're like a brother to me, you know that? Our family. I know. This is so fucked up. God! Jeremy starts to get back up and sit back down at the picnic table. She's fucking pregnant. And I knew... I knew this morning... I knew it wasn't mine. Why couldn't we all just have a barbecue? (laughs) I I just wanted to have a barbecue with my friends. I don't think we're friends anymore, Jeremy. And that seems like a good point to cut back to Len. Len was fleeing the scene from what I gathered. Is that right? Yes. He has a half-baked plan and he wants to drive back out to the lamppost. Fantastic. So the route out to the lamppost takes you about 10 minutes to drive, or at least it normally takes you about 10 minutes to drive. What happens this time is that you hit a traffic jam on a main road before you turn off onto the road where that lamppost is. The tailback seems to be going on for at least a few hundred yards. Up in the distance, it's beginning to get dark at this stage, up in the distance, you can see the flashing lights of maybe ambulances and um, fire engines. The traffic eventually does start moving, uh, and and it snakes around. What you can see is a pretty awful car accident. This isn't the lamppost that you visited with Natasha. But as you're driving past, you can see that there is something very odd about this lamppost. There there is a car, for a start, wrapped around it. It looks like the kind of accident that no one is walking away from. Mm -hmm. But the lamppost, as you move past it, those buds that you saw on the other lamppost, you know, this one maybe had the same, except this time they look like they're in full bloom. The whole thing is covered with these, what look like twisted lilies growing up out of it, made of metal and concrete. Okay, I stop there for a second, and then can I run to our lamppost? Yeah, yeah, if you eventually move through the traffic jam, past all the rubberneckers, Mm -hmm. and... You head off towards your lamppost. Yeah. As you're moving in that direction, there's a bit of traffic going past, but that that bit of road is fairly clear. Yeah, I'll take the shoulder if I need to. The traffic here moves fairly fast. Mm-hmm. And as you're coming towards the lamppost, you, you go to try to slow down and find somewhere to pull over. But the brakes, is it that they're not responding or is it just that you're, you're not really able to make your foot work the brakes? There's just this strange, strange compulsion running through your head. You, you can feel it's almost like the, the lamppost, which you can see now getting closer and closer as you speed up, is covered with all these flowers. And it's, it's almost like it's exerting a magnetic attraction on the car, or not even on the car, on yourself. Just this mm. overwhelming compulsion to floor the accelerator and aim right at it. Jesus Christ! <gasps> Can you give me a driving roll, please? <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Do you want to succeed or fail this? This is amazing. <laughs> 
You thought you'd survive this game, Cup? <laughs> Should have gone to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> I rolled a 68 over 15. Oh, no. So, the last thing, perhaps, that goes through your mind as the car accelerates <laughs> and hits the lamppost is perhaps some bit of comfort or revelation that there is real magic in the world. And then God. I think that's it for Len. <sighs> yeah, great. He, he had a plan. <laughs> 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 oh. No, that's fine. That's a comfort. <laughs> <laughs> With that, let's cut back to the sisters who were upstairs with Simon. Can you fix him, Evie? I mean, look at him. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me about the second accident? I didn't remember it either. It's only now coming to me. He was just never there. Just woke up the next morning after the ritual, and Jeremy was in bed next to me again, and Simon never existed. So you did a ritual that made... that made Richard and I forget Simon? And then... who did the ritual that made you forget about the accident? That's a great question. Maybe we need one more now. So we can all forget all of this. Where's the man in the suit? I go down the stairs. Uh, I think I'll just follow you. Just completely perplexed. I, I don't know. There's no frame of reference for like how to deal with this or how to even process this stuff. So I don't know. Let's find the man in the suit. He'll know things. He'll know things, right? How do we find him? Uh, I'm just going to go out to the front porch and just start yelling man in suit <laughs> I think he will grab her. I don't know if we want he said if we didn't take care of this that he was going to come back and kill people I don't know if we want him here he said what he said take care of it ourselves yeah I I he was he was talking about necromancy he had a weird bone compass um and I, I don't I don't know. He he said that we had to fix it. I think he's talking about Jeremy. I think he's I tried. I can't do it alone. But I've come to realize that maybe I can't have him. It hasn't been the same. I thought it could be just like it was, but he's not the same. Uh, maybe I pushed him into your arms. But either way, it, it's not what I wanted. I think that that's the theme of the day. I don't think anything, I don't think any of this is what any of us wanted. Right. So we just got to fix it, Nat. We just got to fix it. We got to make it right. Okay. Come with me. I lead her into the kitchen to the knife drawer. Hey, I know what it's like to be cupped during a scenario. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave this up to Chuck primarily. Whether we want to resolve this mechanically or narratively. You're also, at this point, I think, presupposing that Jeremy would be fighting back. Because I don't think that he would be. In which case, let's frame it like this. So, is Evelyn taking a knife as well, or is it just Natasha? I think that she's taking a knife, yeah. I think that she kind of resembles that same flattened affect that Jeremy had when he was going out to the backyard. I think that there's kind of a resignation. Uh, before, when I close the knife drawer, I offer my pinky to Evelyn in a way that we used to do when we were girls. And we do our special hand sign solemnly, more solemnly than ever before. But just so she knows, I'm in it with her. So having got the knives, you're heading outside and there's Jeremy and Richard 
on the patio. Jeremy's got a bit of blood on his face. Richard, obviously, is still covered in blood. Where's the, um, that fork? Well, I had it less. I think I probably just set it down on the table when I sat down here. Hmm. Richard's been eyeing that fork. And I think he grabs the fork. So it sounds like there is going to be something of an orgy of violence here as the three of you turn on Jeremy. This is like torture for me, Scott, not being (laughs) the center of the violence. As the girls come out and... Jeremy's sitting at the picnic table still, and he glances over and he sees them. I would imagine probably sees that they're carrying knives. The knives are hidden behind our backs, I think. Fair enough. Mine is. Uh, he's a cop. He he recognizes the body language. Um, <laughs> and he actually just resumes sort of staring into the middle distance and he takes another bite of macaroni salad. Sweetheart, Avi and I talked, and it's going to be okay. And then I kissed Jeremy on the lips. I missed you, honey. I'll always miss you. Evie? If it's a boy, maybe name it Simon? Uh, This is a gut punch. Fuck that. As soon as you said that, Richard's going to grab that fork and stick it into you. (laughs) It's a real Caesar at the Cynic kind of scenario. As soon as you go for it, we're stabbing now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, let's not go to the dice for this then. It sounds like (laughs) there is a frenzy of stabbing that goes on. And... A short while later, the three of you left standing are covered in blood, and there's just the the still form of Jeremy lying there on the ground in a spreading pool of blood. Why is there so much blood if he's already dead? Just so much blood. I shouldn't have worn white to this picnic. <laughs> <laughs> I should have worn closed toed shoes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> These crocs are just full of ketchup and blood. <laughs> they squish when I walk now. Jeez. <laughs> it's like a Play Doh Fun Factory down there. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Evie, will you check his pulse? Yeah, um, she'll lean down and touch his neck. Oh, he's quite dead, but then again, wasn't he dead before? Natasha looks up and looks all around, seeing if this mysterious man will appear to tell them everything's okay now. No. So you are left there with the dead body of your husband. Night falls and the man does not return. The police don't turn up and you just have the dead body of Jeremy down there on the patio and whatever it is that's waiting for you up in Simon's bedroom. I guess we'll have to dig a hole. I'm going to pull the the nice uh, checkered board picnic cloth that's on the table and and put it over Jeremy's body. Okay, yeah. Richard's gonna go upstairs. Simon is still laying there on the bed, still as you left him, still with the blood bubbling up from what's left of his mouth. I'm gonna try to pick him up. Mm. I'm kind of feeling a little emotionally dead inside, so I'm just gonna pick him up. The bones do grind together quite horribly as you do so. Ugh. And I'll start walking down the stairs with him. Okay. To go to the backyard. 
And what are you doing once you're there? I'll lay him down on the ground. I'll say, um, I'm so sorry, Simon. I'm sorry this happened to you. I know you're suffering, but I have to do this. And grabbing one of the knives on the ground, I'm going to, as best I know how and quickly as I can, try to stop his suffering. Okay. And on that point, shall we find out what lies in the future for our three survivors? You obviously have two dead bodies to explain. Or maybe it just seems to you that you should have to explain them. But somehow, for some reason, no one ever asks you to. No one really seems to notice that Jeremy's missing. No one but you really seems to remember Simon. Their bodies are still there and very real, buried in the back garden, but... no one cares. But you also have, obviously, the, the knowledge of what has happened to deal with. Unfortunately, perhaps, or maybe fortunately, depending on your perspective, the man who threatened to come back does not come back. You're not sure what happened to him, but he does not return. What do the rest of you do at this stage? How does this shape your lives from this point onwards? Natasha needs to know. She will not rest until she finds the man. She gets Richard and Evelyn to give complete descriptions. She gets the contact at the police station to draw a rough sketch of what he might look like. And she travels the world, funding her travels with articles, but just searching for the man with the bone compass hmm. until her dying day. And how about Richard and Evelyn? I think Richard is forever changed from this. I think he is going to go off on his own. And his writing career takes a different turn. Instead of writing about heroics in the Toronto region, uh, he starts looking for signs of ghosts and people coming back from the dead, wanting to just understand the truth of how that happened. Does it happen to others? Seeking it out. Yeah, certainly for both Natasha and Richard, this probably does end up taking you down some fairly strange paths, realizing that there is a much weirder world out there than you ever realized before, full of very strange and broken people trying to change the world in sometimes quite horrifying ways. And how about Evelyn? Evelyn is now on her own. Richard has gone off. She is carrying a child, and she's not sure whose it is. I think that she is also forever changed. I think she kind of, like, the light goes out in her. Um, and for a while, she's even just, like, struggling to function, you know, as a human. So she probably, like, stops going into work and loses her job. I think eventually she, like, she has the baby, and then her entire life becomes about this child. Mm. And she both protects it with her life and is also just terrified of it and accepts that she is its mother, but also just can never truly accept the kid. And maybe, maybe if you really try you can convince yourself that it looks like Richard. And shall we leave things there?
You are listening to Ain't Slayed Nobody. For ad-free episodes, heaps of bonus content, and special programming, please join our Patreon posse at patreon.com slash ain't slayed. Or subscribe to Ain't Slayed Nobody Plus at Apple Podcasts. See the show notes for full credits, and help us grow by posting friendly reviews and spreading the word to your friends and followers. Thank you, and good luck out there.